Since the Supreme Court overturned Roe versus Wade, the abortion battle has raged from state to state. In November, five states will allow their voters to decide the issue. Statewide referendums vary widely, and advocates are watching the outcomes closely. Capitol Hill correspondent Matt Galka reports. Abortion is on the ballot in November. It's the battle cry we've heard from both sides for different reasons as we head into the midterm elections. The issue is expected to drive voter turnout, but in some states, voters will have a direct hand in deciding how much access or how little they'd have to the procedure where they live. In addition to candidates, five states, California, Montana, Michigan, Vermont, and Kentucky, will have different abortion proposals on their midterm ballots. Voters in California, Michigan, and Vermont will decide on whether to have the right to an abortion added to their state constitutions. Kelly Lester with And Then There Were None Ministries says her biggest concern is how regulated or unregulated the procedure might become in some of the states. By removing any restrictions, what is what they want to do in uh, Michigan, it's also what they want to do in California along with some other things, it basically makes it a free-for-all. And so there will be no inspections of abortion facilities. There will be no mandates on what level of care the women are getting at these locations. And so it really is a very, very dangerous thing. If approved, the Kentucky Amendment would stop the state from, quote, securing or protecting the right to abortion or require funding of an abortion. And in Montana, the Born Alive referendum would provide legal rights to infants, including those born alive after an abortion. It could put doctors on the hook for felony charges. We refuse to accept a future... Following the Supreme Court decision overturning Roe versus Wade, the country saw how abortion could be a political weapon in the midterm election cycle. In August, Kansas voters rejected a proposed amendment that would have limited abortion access in the deeply red state. The Human Coalition's Chelsea Yeoman doesn't believe that result is a sign of things to come. Kansas was a really unique situation where the wording on the ballot was confusing. You had tens of millions of dollars pouring in, uh, Planned Parenthood going door to door. Uh, so I don't, I don't think that's indicative of American sentiment. I think Americans understand that humans in the womb are alive um, and that they are human and overall that some life should be protected. The outcome could end up being a patchwork of rules nationwide because federal proposals on both sides of the aisle regarding the procedure will likely not have enough votes to pass. It's why some pro-choice Democrats believe the statewide measures are important. Uh, the Democrats are for codifying Roe. Uh, we have a bill that's passed the House. It's passed uh, uh, the, uh, hopefully will pass the Senate. Uh, the Republicans, as you know, with Lindsey Graham, want to have uh, a ban, and they're debating how many weeks to have that ban. Let me say this. I mean, my guess is many of your viewers will disagree with my view. Uh, on abortion. I think it is a fundamental right for women and to make that decision with their doctor. We can agree to disagree. And the question in this country is how can we start having conversations, being true to our ideals and principles, but still finding common ground? Voter registration data would indicate that Democrats have made some gains, especially with women, since the Supreme Court's decision to overturn Roe v. Wade. But other polling would indicate that abortion is ranked in the middle of the pack, behind things like inflation, the economy, and crime when it comes to reasons why voters are being driven to the polls. What does that all mean? Well, it means that all eyes will be on results as they start to roll in on Election Day in November. Matt Gelka, CBN News. Well, there's a big election coming up, if you haven't heard about it, uh, and it's going to decide a lot of things. Five states are going to have a similar referendum to what Kansas has. Uh, this is going to turn into messy democracy, uh, and my hope is following the election, can we actually come together as a people and stop demonizing the other side? I'm hearing again and again, uh, if the other side wins, then our democracy is at stake. Uh, it's not. It's not. These are elections. This is what uh, democracies do. We have elections, and the good news is two years from now, we're going to have another election. Uh, and in that process, we, the people, get to decide the rules that we agree to as a republic to say this is our governing standard. 
That gets upset when the Supreme Court, which is not a legislature, comes in and makes decisions for all of us that we have no appeal, we can't vote, we're disenfranchised. That's exactly what happened with Roe versus Wade. The Supreme Court made law. It's not in the Constitution. They found some shadow, some penumbra of the Constitution having to do with a right of privacy, and they turned that into legal abortion. Even Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg said Roe was wrongly decided. So now we turn to ourselves and say, what do we believe and how is that going to be reflected in the laws of the land? This is going to get messy, but that's part of democracy. Well, turning to the fight for control of Congress, Republicans are growing more confident of a red tsunami at the polls in two weeks. John Jessup has more on that story from our CBN News Bureau in Washington. John? That's right, Gordon. Republicans believe they have a good shot at taking the House, and they're hopeful they can flip the Senate, according to a report by Axios. Pollsters and political strate strategists believe the GOP could win 20 House seats and take solid control of the lower chamber. Republican leaders are also optimistic they'll gain at least one seat necessary to take the Senate. Polls show top issues for voters are the economy and inflation. That's a big problem for Democrats who control the House, Senate, and the White House currently. On CBS's Face of the Nation, House Speaker Nancy Pelosi said Democrats need a new message. When I hear people talk about inflation, as I heard him there, we have to change that subject. Inflation is a global phenomenon. The fight is not about inflation. It's about the cost of living. Polls also show President Biden's low approval ratings are hurting Democratic candidates. Well, turning to medical news, a severe respiratory illness among children continues to surge throughout the nation. Hospitals in 43 states and Washington, D.C. report an increase in cases of RSV, short for respiratory syncytial virus. Emergency departments have been full, our hospitals have been full, our intensive care units have been full. The respiratory infection is the leading cause of hospitalization in infants and can be life-threatening for both infants and toddlers. Symptoms can mirror the common cold or flu. Meanwhile, about 1,000 students at a Northern Virginia high school missed classes due to flu-like illness last week. The school canceling activities and sports after teachers and students reported flu-like and gastrointestinal symptoms. State health officials are working to learn the cause of that outbreak. Well, new research shows one in five Americans report struggling with a mental health challenge such as depression, trauma, or anxiety. However, many more people may suffer in silence, including Christian men. Now CBN is airing a free program to help men of faith handle mental health issues from a biblical perspective. Medical reporter Lori Johnson shares this preview. Carried Real Support for Mental Health is an interactive program aimed at harnessing the power of faith to heal. The primary battlefield that you and I have to confront is right here. It's the battle for our minds. Reverend Sammy Rodriguez says men may not realize their problems often rub off on others. It is egregious, especially in Christian homes. So goes the mental health of the man to a great degree. So goes the spiritual vitality of the family. In the program, Rodriguez points out biblical examples of God's emotional healing. There's a prophet named Elijah in 1 Kings chapter 19 who suffered from anxiety, fear, and depression. And he required supernatural intervention. Really, God did therapy. Mental health experts say guys in particular can have difficulty admitting problems. There's a stigma associated uh, with mental health and men. It's, it's seen as a sign of weakness. Keeping those feelings bottled up, however, often makes things worse. We act out what we haven't worked out. Uh, everything just starts to explode. And I think that's why you see a lot of substance abuse, a lot of anger and more coming out of men. Even Christian men not struggling with mental health issues can learn how to help brothers who are. You know, the scriptures say faithful are the wounds of a friend. That's the man who's speaking the life of another man who genuinely cares about him and says, hey, wait a second. Um, and when the time's right, what's going on? Are you, are you doing okay? You seem like you're struggling, man. You, know, you seem a little off today. Um, those windows 
are massive opportunities to speak. Celebrity testimonials reveal these things can happen to anyone. This summit can help you know what to do, how to do. I even tell some stories uh, from our own family and some things that we did uh, to try to help our family members. After the summit, there's follow-up, a 21-day challenge that includes daily devotionals, information about where to get reliable professional help, and ways to stay strong through relationships with other Christian men. Lori Johnson, CBN News. Thanks, Lori. The Promise Keepers one-hour summit is called Carried, Real Support for Mental Health, airing on the CBN News Channel Tuesday night at 8 p.m. Eastern Time. You can watch it by downloading the CBN News app or the CBN Family app. Gordon, a real uh, important issue that really needs to be addressed and talked about more. Yes, and it should be. And if you're coming out of this pandemic, realize in our isolation, we have all had uh, issues. And, and whether that's grieving the loss of community, uh, grieving how things used to be, wanting to have a... Uh, you know, return to normal, all of these things we need to recognize are affecting us, affecting us emotionally and mentally. The generation coming up that's been, their brains have literally been rewired by social media and by these smartphones and all of these things. It's going to be the one of the most challenging things they have to do, deal with. And for our generation, we need to recognize we need to provide leadership. We can't do that if we ourselves are having problems. So if you need help, tune into that special. Again, it's Tuesday night on the CBN News Channel, uh, 8 p.m. Uh, uh, that's Eastern Time. Real support for mental health, and uh, I encourage you to watch it. Pounding on the door, and when it was open, storming inside. More than a dozen armed FBI agents raided the home of a pro-life activist, Mark Houck. Terrifying his wife, seven children, with guns drawn, they arrested Mark. This outrageous raid has raised serious questions about the FBI, and CBN's Dan Andros reports. It was terrifying. You know, the children are screaming and crying. Um, you, know, you just figure, like, one move from a four-year-old and something tragic could have happened. Heavily armed, um, shields, um, helmets, vests, big, huge, long rifle type guns. They moved to the front door, proceeding to bang and scream, frightening her family. Mark says, please, I have seven babies in the house. I'm going to open the door. He opens the door and immediately there's Guns pointed at him, uh, a gun pointed at me on the staircase. During the ensuing chaos, she repeatedly asked the agents to identify themselves and provide documentation as to why they were there. Do you have a warrant? And they said, well, we're taking him whether we have a warrant or not. And I said, well, you can't do that. According to records, the arrest stems from an October 2021 incident in Philadelphia between Hauk and a Planned Parenthood volunteer. The volunteer claims that during an argument, Hauk shoved him to the ground. The feds have charged Hauk with violating the Freedom of Access to Clinic Entrances, or FACE Act. His attorney, Peter Breen, strongly disagrees. They were away from the gates. The alleged victim, the abortion escort, walked to them. No patients around, no reason to go there other than to plant himself next to Mark's son and harass him. Local police called to the scene that day noted only a minor scrape, declining to pursue the case any further. Bruce Love, the volunteer, later filed a criminal complaint that was eventually thrown out of state court. As to why the Justice Department would bother pursuing the case, Breen sees Hauk as the first casualty in a larger war. Mark is innocent. Period. End of sentence. That's it. And this is a political prosecution, pure and simple. This is really their first major foray, their first public attempt to intimidate and frighten the pro-life movement. And they, you know, as Bishop Coffey said, they picked the wrong guy. While the raid shocked the Hawks, the federal case against him was no surprise. The Justice Department sent Hauk this letter in April, notifying him that he was the target of a grand jury investigation involving the FACE Act. Hauk then retained the Thomas More Society for legal representation. Emails Thomas More provided to CBN show a heavy-handed raid 
was totally unnecessary. They volunteered to bring their client in to avoid putting the Hauk family through, quote, needless disruption. Those emails were apparently ignored, as the next anyone heard from the government was at 7 a.m. that Friday morning when federal agents banged on Hauk's door. My dream, my vision, is that Merrick Garland personally apologizes to the Hauk family for what he did to them. Facing up to 11 years in prison and a $350,000 fine. Gordon? This Mark's version of what happened outside the clinic. Yeah, these details are important because Mark alleges that he was well within his rights on the city sidewalk uh, doing his normal sidewalk ministry outside this Planned Parenthood clinic when the Planned Parenthood volunteer approached him and apparently trying to get them to leave the scene uh, because he didn't like them being there was hurling vulgarities in close proximity to his 12-year-old son. And that is when he said he came over and asked him to, to back up. And when he didn't, uh, he pushed him, causing him to fall, uh, resulting in just a minor scrape, according to local police. Uh, and so it just would seem, according to his version of events, uh, that he was simply defending his son. And if there was no patient around, there's no FACE Act violation. Well, uh, wh then why did the feds take up the case? And, and that is the $64,000 question. And 22 members of Congress have wrote, written a letter uh, to the Biden administration looking for an answer to that very question. Because what happened here was local police were called to the scene. Uh, they noted only a minor scrape. They declined to pursue anything further and told uh, you know, the, the Planned Parenthood volunteer to go ahead and file a criminal complaint, which he did. Then he never showed up to the hearings. Multiple times the judge rescheduled, prompting him to throw it out. Why the federal government would then pick it up is a head scratcher that they have not provided answers to. Well, I think the biggest head scratcher is why deploy assault weapons and this not the number of agents deployed in order to serve an arrest warrant. Uh, the, this makes no sense. Uh, I'm a lawyer. I'm, you, you, you get the local sheriff to deliver a summons and you voluntarily surrender uh, to, to the police or the FBI. You don't do this kind of 7 a.m. Uh, raid on a home. So it, this, what, what's the government trying to do? This just seems to be intimidation tactics. Yeah, and especially when, uh, as far as the raid goes, they had a let. They wrote to them and said, "Hey, we will come in. We will bring our client in. We don't think you have a case, but if you decide to pursue this, we will bring them him in." Specifically saying to avoid a situation like this, a dangerous situation. And in the pictures you saw, Gordon, in the piece, uh, that was well after the actual raid itself, because uh, Ryan Marie couldn't get to her phone during the chaos of it all. So that was after it. Had, it was winding down, and you can still see multiple agents, heavily armed six cars in there and she said there was way more than that uh, at the time of the raid so it, it it it's really a concerning uh, ordeal all right well what's going to happen next what's what's next on the trial agenda well they're they're in the discovery process now gathering all the evidence one key thing there is will there be video of this there are cameras on the planned parenthood building outside um so it would stand to reason that there is video of this event of this uh, uh incident uh, but they're they're gathering all that information now in the discovery process, and uh, their attorneys told me they're expecting a trial date sometime early next year. All right. Well, Dan, thanks for the report. We'll be watching this case very closely. Uh, for you at home, did, underline this case. Uh, we, we've heard a lot about uh, police. We've heard a lot about defund the police. We've heard a lot about racial profiling. Uh, but there's something really serious here where the law enforcement is being weaponized for political means. It's not new. Uh, when you look back at the civil rights movement, law enforcement was weaponized and they used water cannons and attack dogs in order to shut down peaceful protests. Here, we're dealing with the same kind of thing, but it's, in a, it's a different target and that target is the pro-life community. So whether you're a baker in Colorado or you're trying to protest outside of a clinic in Philadelphia, uh, because that ideology doesn't match the ideology of the government, they feel entitled to intimidate you. 
Um, we, we've covered a lot of things on this show about how America is becoming a police state, the number of regulations that have been enacted, not by the Congress, but by the bureaucrats. Uh, the number of those regulations that have criminal penalties, where if you're selling an illegal orchid in Alabama, you get a full armed team uh, breaking down your door in a pre-dawn raid. If you're a guitar maker in Tennessee and you're selling exotic woods, it's on some kind of list that the government has put out. Well, then you get a full armed team shutting down your entire business. We have to wake up as a culture and say, no, we're not a police state. Uh, we don't go along with these tactics. It's not, it should not happen in the United States of America. Government is there to protect our liberty. Government is not there to enforce an ideology and try to stamp out an ideology. That's not America we, that we want to live, leave to our children and our grandchildren. It's time to pray for our country. I'm greatly concerned about many things, whether it's the weaponization of law enforcement, the surveillance state that we all live, live in, where everything is examined and everything is recorded, uh, our polarization in our politics, the surveys that, that show if you're a Democrat and you think the Republicans will win the, the midterms, then it's the end of democracy. If you're a Republican and you think the Democrats are going to win, then it's an end of free speech, it's an end of freedom of conscience, it's an end of America. All of these things are driving us apart. We need to come back to one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. That's the American dream. In our history, have we achieved that dream? I would say no. But let's keep trying. Let's not give up. Let's hold to that dream that, yes, we can be one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Here's what the Apostle Paul had to say as his counsel to Timothy. Therefore, I exhort, first of all, that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings, and all who are in authority that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now, you may say, well, I can't pray for the president, I don't agree with him, or I can't pray for the Speaker of the House, or I can't pray for the Senate my majority leader or the Senate minority leader. I can't pray for these people because I don't agree with him. Well, the apostle Paul was writing about an emperor named Nero who would ultimately kill him. And he was saying, let's pray for people in authority. So if he can do that in a time of extraordinary persecution, we can do that now because this is the will of God. Let's pray. Lord, we lift America to you. We lift the dream that our forefathers had that we could be a city on a hill. We lift the dream of the early English settlers right here in Jamestown at Cape Henry, where the first thing they did, they didn't plant a flag, they planted a cross. And they asked that you would come and reign and rule this land. Lord, we renew these covenants. And we ask that you would shine your face on us and give us your peace. Without you, we're lost, but with you, we can do all things. So we turn to you. We turn from our wickedness. We turn from all the things that we have done that dishonor you and your name. And we ask that you would restore to us, first and foremost, our love for you and our love for one another. Do this, Lord. We can't do it without you. We need your love to be shed abroad in our hearts. Be with us now, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.
To join with us as we pray for our country, all you have to do is call us, 1-800-700-7000, or go to PrayForAmerica.com and let us know you'll be praying with us. Now, when you do, we'll send you a prayer flag and a Pray for America bumper sticker, so if you'd like those, call us, 1-800-700-7000, or go to PrayForAmerica.com. Terry? Well, coming up later, the story behind one of the biggest successes in Shark Tank history. See how the creator of Grace and Lace turned a small hobby into a multi-million dollar company. And then up next, the bad girl from Brooklyn. This pop star rode that image all the way to the top of the charts. Then she risked her career to go good. Find out why when we come back. CBN invites you to join us in 40 days of prayer for the country. Call us or go to PrayForAmerica.com and let us know you'll be praying for the nation. When you do, we'll send you this prayer flag and bumper sticker. In addition, your city or town will be highlighted on our online Pray for America nationwide map. Sign up today. Call 1-800-700-7000 or go to PrayForAmerica.com. Jeannie Ortega had it all, money, fame, fans. She was a teenage pop sensation known as the bad girl from Brooklyn. Even at the height of her fame, Jeannie was still being haunted by the demons of her past. My dream that I had as a little girl to be a famous singer had come true. I was living the dream. In 2006, at the age of 19, Jeannie Ortega's song, Crowded, hit the Billboard charts. Later that year, her album reached number one. The pop star from Brooklyn seemed to have it all. However, beneath the surface, there was darkness she could not escape. At five years old, Jeannie began experiencing night terrors. Her family practiced witchcraft and decided to baptize Jeannie into Santeria, a satanic cult, against her will. She put a cigar in her mouth backwards and blew the cigar smoke all over my body, and she's just chanting uh, as part of this ritual, and I felt very uncomfortable. Jeannie recalls a chaotic home life and continual darkness. At the age of seven, she thought about ending her life. One day I was in the tub, and my mom's razor blades were there, and I just felt this sense like I should just grab them and cut myself and it'd be over, and all the chaos would stop and all the darkness would go away. I don't know why I had hope, but there was this deep-rooted hope that there would be better, that there was more to life than what I was experiencing. That same year, Jeannie's parents gave her a gift that would change her life. I got my first karaoke machine. It was also the time, in the midst of all these suicidal thoughts, that I realized the power of music. At 13, Jeannie's voice captured the attention of a well-connected taxi cab driver. I'm in a New York City taxi cab singing along, and the guy's like, I know famous managers, like, I'll introduce you. He's just like, wow, you have a beautiful voice, you're beautiful, you need to be a star. That's kind of how it really happened. That was my big break. Over the next three years, Jeannie was developed as an artist, and at age 16, she signed her first record deal, though stardom came with a price. We had photo shoots. I was a teenager, and I was asked to dress provocatively. I was put in positions that, that I felt uncomfortable with. Jeannie eventually embraced her bad girl image and began living it up as a star. I was at the top of the charts, touring, doing all these shows, getting all this money. I had never seen that kind of money in my life. It was all mine, and I was living the dream. However, fame failed to satisfy, and though she never practiced Santeria, that darkness from childhood returned. Nothing mattered. I was still completely broken and empty, and I needed more. And I felt life is just something isn't right. I now have everything that I ever wanted. I have influence, and I still don't want to be here. Those thoughts of suicide came back. That's when a friend asked Jeannie a timely question. My friend just came up to me and asked, like, do you need to go to church? I was just, I knew it was God. I knew she was sent to me. 
and I just gasped, yes, yes, how did you know? You know, and she invited me to a Christian church. It was my first time in a Christian church. I'm in this church and I'm looking at everyone thinking that they're out of their minds because they're talking to God out loud. And I thought they were crazy, but there was like a holy envy that I had. I was, I wanted that. I wanted to talk to God that freely. I wanted to cry and let it all out. And then the pastor had invited me up to the altar. He didn't say anything to me, just walked by me, tapped my shoulder. He must have been praying for the Lord to touch me. And immediately I dropped, I felt, I felt God. And I felt his presence just overwhelm me. And I fell to my knees and I began to weep and weep, but I knew it was God. And it was almost as if a surgery was taking place in my heart. Jeannie had given her heart to God, which caused conflict with her record label. I had never felt peace and I started to feel peace. My label didn't sign a Christian artist. <laughs> they signed a bad girl from Brooklyn, so they didn't want to continue. I lost my record deal. My whole world came crashing down. The carpet that I was so busy flaunting on all those years was pulled out from under me. And it forced me to look up and ask God, wait, do you have a purpose for me? What, what, sh what do you think I should do now? Over time, Jeannie found her purpose as a Christian recording artist, singing songs to the God who set her free from darkness. She ministers with her husband, who is a pastor, and her desire is for others to know that God can rescue anyone. Like, I don't talk the way I talked. I don't dress the way I dressed. There was always despair and hopelessness. When you have Christ, He's victorious over any darkness. You're bulletproof. You, greater is God that's in you than any demonic, any darkness, anything that's in this world. And that's how I live my life. And that's what I try to empower others to really accept because it's ours. So with everything that I do, I do it to just bring glory to God. And so many of us live defeated. And so many of us live as victims to the darkness when we don't realize that we've overcome because of Christ. You know, Jeannie experienced darkness as a child in a very overt way. Uh, I was just talking with my grandkids the other day about how the Bible says that our enemy, the one who is darkness himself, who wants to keep us from the light, keep us from a relationship with Christ, keep us from being free, that he comes around like a prowling lion. You know, it's not something where he just charges into your life. It's subtle. It's a little bit here. It's a little bit there. Pretty soon you're dressing a certain way. You're acting a certain way. You're talking a certain way. And all of that stuff is like baggage. You know, it just weighs on you. There's no joy. There is no joy. And yet the Bible says you, cannot, you and I can choose joy. We can choose joy. We can choose the light. We don't have to walk with that burden, with that weightiness on us. It says, what, what relationship does light have with darkness? None. Run to the light, my friend. Run to the light. If you're stuck in a place of darkness, run to the light. And there are lots of ways for you to begin to do that. The first is to talk to God about it to say, I'm stuck here and I, I'm asking you, God, to rebuke the devourer on my behalf. And then just speak to the darkness in your life and say, I bind you in Jesus' name. Begin to worship because the Bible says God inhabits the praises of his people. Worship will break bondage for you. Put worship music on in your house. I've had friends who have said, you know, there's just like a dark presence in my house. Put the worship music on. Begin to sing with it. Pray with it. Agree with it. The enemy has to flee when you tell him to. It's part of how this whole thing functions. Choose joy. Choose Jesus in the midst of all your darkness. Anything that is keeping you from the light is not of God. But you have to be willing to turn your back on it. You know, sometimes we embrace the darkness because it gives us something else that we want or need. In the end, it'll get you. But you can choose joy.
you can choose freedom. Jesus said, I came to set the captive free. I don't know what you're captive to, but I know that the ability to choose to leave that behind you is right inside of you. You get to do it and you can do it right now. Why go another day being controlled by, influenced by, oppressed by something that you were never created for? You were created for a relationship with the one who knows you by name, loves you fully, wants to forgive you, wants to be a part of your life, has eternal plans for you, not just here, eternal. Pray with me. Let's just pray right now. God, there are things in my life that I know are not of you, and I have let them grab hold of me. It's like they have their, their hooks in me. I want to be free. You said you came to set the captive free. Will you set me free today? Lord, I confess to you all of my sins. Tell them what they are. Just name them. Jesus, I turn from these things and I turn to you. And I grab hold of you with all my might. I choose this day for you to be the Lord of my life, the Savior of my soul. I bind the strong man in my life in your name, Jesus. Set me free, I pray. Give me the new beginning, the life that you promised. You gave your life so I could give you mine. I do that right now completely. And I'm asking you to change me from the inside out. Change me the way I see things, how I feel about things, what I think. Lord, I choose joy. I choose you today. And I'm asking you to fill me with your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. It's a new beginning for you. No more darkness, only the light. Get into the Word of God. Begin to read the book of John in the New Testament and then read it through to Revelation and see what God speaks to your heart. If you need prayer with someone, our line's always open. It's 1-800-700-7000. Just call and pray with the friend who answers the phone. Welcome back to the 700 Club. Iranians worldwide continue to protest the death of a 22-year-old woman killed by religious police. Protesters in Washington, D.C. Saturday and cities around the world marched in solidarity with those calling for regime change in Iran. Tens of thousands took to the streets of the nation's capital, as well as London, Berlin, Toronto, and many more cities. Protesters calling on President Biden and other Western powers to abandon negotiations with the Iranian government over its nuclear deal. Well, CBN Thailand recently launched a new series of videos on Facebook and YouTube. They feature the Superbook star Gizmo teaching children how to draw popular Superbook characters. The series generating a lot of excitement with more than a thousand views and prompting many children to send in their own drawings of Superbook characters. Well, you can find out more about what CBN is doing around the world by going to cbn.com slash international. Melissa and Rick were $80,000 in the red. There were times when Rick was so desperate for cash, he'd go door to door asking neighbors if he could pick their weeds. Well, Melissa wasn't as worried about paying down their debt. She was more interested in paying it forward. Meet Melissa Hinnant, the creator of Grace and Lace, a successful online clothing company that made history on Shark Tank. We did a million dollars overnight in sales, and no company in the history of the five years that Shark Tank had aired before we were on had ever done that volume in sales. Melissa and her husband Rick have come a long way from when they met. Melissa was in real estate. Rick had been living on credit cards, trying to start a number of businesses, and was $80,000 in debt. When he told me, I was shocked. My parents always just taught me to believe if you don't have money to pay for it, you don't buy it. I ended up knocking on people's doors to ask them if there was anything that I could do. Could I mow their lawn? Could I pick their weeds? Pretty humbling. Before long, Rick's landscaping business took off and the newly married couple started working their way out of the red. I was doing everything possible to annihilate that debt as quick as I could. All the while, the Hennants were tithing. God says, test me. I love a challenge, and so if God says, test me, I'm gonna sign up. 
Even during our hardest financial times, we still always gave. And I know that if God is going to bless us, we have to continue to be faithful with giving to Him. Within two years, Rick had tripled his income by adding Christmas light installation to his business. He paid off the rest of his loan, and soon the couple was completely debt-free with a six-figure income. Yet Rick didn't think that was enough. I think I had bought into society saying, here's what you should have. Here's what will make you happy. He saw uh, where all of his friends were at, and I think it kind of was a little bit of a pride issue. Melissa was convinced that money was mainly a tool to help the needy. If money can make me have more of a difference, then that's great, but I didn't need it. And there was this civil war inside. Yes, I wanted to give more money, but did I want to make more money so I could have more material things? I simply asked God, do I have money before you? And what I heard was, yes, you do. I asked God to forgive me instantly. I told God, whether I make a lot of money or not, I'm done striving. It became about, instead of what can I acquire, how can I help the kingdom? When I surrendered to God, my landscape company exploded. Rick made $85,000 in one month hanging lights. Then Melissa's knitting hobby turned into a major source of income for the couple. One day, I just had an idea that I wanted to knit and create a pair of socks that had lace on it. And everywhere I went, people would stop and ask me like, your socks, they're so cute, they have lace on them. Where did you get them? So Melissa started selling her lacy boot socks online. And soon, the couple landed on Shark Tank. And we ended up with a $3 million year. It was like God saying, look, I can do things that will blow your mind like that. And now we've got goals of doing around 15 million this year. But I don't know that we would have seen the success that we have if we weren't giving, if we weren't tithing. Today, Rick and Melissa have three children and choose to live way below their means so they can help the poor. They've already built 13 orphanages and a freedom house in India. I'll never forget meeting a 14 year old and he looked at me in the face and said, Melissa, this is the first time I've ever slept on a mattress. They like to give to other organizations too, including CBN. What I loved about Operation Blessing is that we were really able to see the fruit of that gift. Now I have the hunger to make more money so we truly can give to all of these places because there's a lot of need out there. For those who want true financial freedom, the Hennens suggest living to give, not get. I would challenge anyone out there to put God first where you are giving, you are blessing, you are helping, and you are changing the world for the good. You know, God isn't looking for people who are like, give me, give me, give me. Everyone has to start somewhere. It does not have to be big. It comes from the simple place of, God, I want your will done in my life. You might be going through a hard financial time, but God still wants your purity of heart in giving. It's one of the great principles of the Bible. We call it the law of reciprocity. Give and it will be given unto you. When you understand that the purpose of money is to help other people, well, then you get it. It's all part of the gospel. For God so loved the world that he gave. He's always looking to help people. And if you're looking to help people, well, then you're in his will. If you want to do, do that and do that on a regular basis, I encourage you to join the 700 Club. When you give, it's wonderful what happens. You come into a whole new appreciation of the benefits of tithing, the confidence that you'll have knowing that God is with you, that he will open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing so you can be even more of a blessing. If you want to start doing that, call us, 1-800-700-7000. Say, yes, I want to be a member of the 700 Club. Some of you can join at 700 Club, which is $20 a month. We also have 700 Club Gold, $40 a month. 1,000 Club is $1,000 a year, and that breaks out to $84 a month. At whatever level, when you call, make sure you ask for Pledge Express. That's electronic monthly giving, the bank doing all the work. And we can send as our gift to you, Power for Life, monthly.
monthly teaching CDs. If you call and pledge now, we'll also send you a special gift, The Lord is My Shepherd, a teaching on Psalm 23. I want you to have it. It's yours when you join. Call us, 1-800-700-7000. Terry? Well, the time has come to answer some of the email questions you've sent in to us. Gordon, this first one comes from Pastor Roger. Do you think Christian nationalism will turn America around for the better? Do you think more Christian churches in America should be into Christian nationalism? Uh, Roger, I would say no. I, I, I believe in a secular state. I believe that there should be no established religion in the United States of America. Enforced religion is no religion at all, and our founding fathers knew that, and they knew it very intimately, having come out of Europe, where you had state churches, and if you were a citizen, you had to belong to the state church, and you had to give to the state church, and the state supported the church. When you, when you look at American colonial history, particularly in uh, states like Virginia, which were under the... Um, Episcopal Church, there was specific land set aside, they call it glebe land, and the income from that land went to the church. I grew up in a neighborhood called Churchland. It was part of Nanceman County, and then it became part of the city of Portsmouth. But it, the reason it has that name is it was set aside to support the state church. They didn't want that, and I agree with them. Uh, let's learn the lessons of history, whether that's Savonarola or Oliver Cromwell. When you try to enforce a theocracy, it doesn't work. People need freedom of conscience. They need that. And if they had that in Israel, uh, then we can have it here in the United States. And that freedom comes when you can turn your back on God and, and you can be none of the above. You can be atheist. You can be agnostic. King David wrote about them. You know, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. That means he knew atheists. So if it happens in Israel, well, it can happen here. So what we need is freedom, and we need freedom of conscience. My concern right now is that we have a majority, uh, a supposed majority, our country's evenly divided, but a, a supposed majority that wants to limit that freedom of conscience in some kind of ideal, ideological group think that this is the way to go. No, we don't need that. We don't need that on either side. Well, this is Gene Gordon who says, I've been praying for three things for three years, and God has not answered those yet. I'm not giving up, but what should I do? I would really appreciate your help. Gene, you would help me if you tell me what you're praying for. <laughs> um, here, here's a prayer that will always get answered, and I learned this from my father. God, can I be part of your plan? Mm. And when you pray that with all of your heart, and you, you're get ready for amazing adventures. If you're praying, God, I, I need these certain things, um, well, you're asking amiss is what James said. And so ask correctly. If you pray in accordance with God, God's will, you know that he hears you. And if you know that he hears you, you know you have the answer. That's what the apostle John said. So what are you praying for? And, and let's really get into that. Why are you praying for it? The better prayer is, God, could you let me in on your plan? I want to be there with you. I want to know what you want to do, and let me join with that. We leave you these words from James. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. God bless you. We'll see you again tomorrow.